Welcome to Lecture 9 on Soil and Plant Macronutrients. This is part of the Soil Science and Plant Nutrition subject ALM 114, which is a component of the agricultural degree offered at North Melbourne Institute of TAFE. Please visit our website www.nmit.edu.au for more information on the educational products that we offer. This lecture was put together by Dr. Dog Rao and myself, Dr. Nikki Cooley. Micronutrients are essential to plant growth, yet are required in much smaller amounts than macronutrients. The eight micronutrients are boron, chloride, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and zinc. Most of the macronutrients represent a larger concentration in the range of 0.1 to 5% or 100 to 5,000 parts per million of dry plant tissue. Whereas the micronutrients generally comprise less than 0.025% or 250 parts per million on a dry plant tissue basis. Chloride is a micronutrient that has a plant tissue concentration similar to that of the macronutrients. Each nutrient cannot be taken up by plants in its elemental or non-charge form, but instead is taken up in an ionic or charge form. There is one exception to this which is boric acid, and this is taken up in the uncharged form. Knowing what form of a nutrient the plant can absorb helps us better focus on what controls the movement of the nutrient in the soil. Of the micronutrients, chloride and molybdenum are mobile in plants, while the others are considered immobile. In this lecture, we are going to overview the micronutrients. We are going to talk about their function in plants, their soil content, deficiency and toxicity symptoms, their cycles in the soil, and finally, the fertilizers that you can purchase. <clears throat> Boron has a suite of functions in the plants. It is involved in RNA and DNA synthesis. It is believed to be important in sugar translocation and carbohydrate metabolism, particularly sugar transport across cell membranes. It is involved in enzyme function, cell wall structure, cell division, and important in flowering and fruiting. Borum exists either as neutral or negatively charged molecules in the soil. When it is at a concentration of less than 0.5 mg per kilogram available, it is regarded as deficient. It is usually found in deficient concentrations in acidic, well-drained sands. When it ranges from 1 to 4 mg per kilogram available to the plant, it is considered as adequate. Borum can have toxic levels in the soil and this usually is 12 mg per kilogram available or more. It is usually toxic in soils in alkaline, poorly leached, sodic clay subsoils. Borum deficiency symptoms range. Some of the images on the slide show typical symptoms. These can include inhibited root growth, inhibited cell division in the shoot, swollen necrotic internodes, deformed roots and shoots, and poor fruit set in grapevines. An important identification of boron deficiency is that borum is highly immobile in the plant. For example, alfalfa boron deficiencies are recognisable by yellow and whitening of the youngest leaves and, ter and terminal bud. Boron deficiency also results in the shortening of internodes given the plants as an abnormal or busy appearance at the top of the stunted plant. It almost has a rosette-like appearance. Not only can you get boron deficiencies in plants, you can also get boron toxicity. This is where excess concentrations of boron result and they usually cause a reduction of crop yield and loss of quality. A boron toxicity looks like yellowing of the leaf tips, intervenal chlorosis and progressive scorching of the leaf margins. Boron toxicity is usually uncommon in many soils unless fertilizers 
or composts are high in boron. Examples of field crops that are most sensitive to boron toxicity include corn and soybeans. The soil plant system is dynamic and strongly influenced by weather with respect to boron cycles. The key to controlling boron is using efficiency in the system as well as sound fertiliser management. Using available knowledge to assess fertiliser boron needs and implementing them for the best efficiency in terms of farmer profits. In order to do this you need to understand components of the boron cycle. It is a d dynamic cycle and it can change daily as it is influenced by the plant, soil, system, weather and fertiliser management. The global boron cycle is primarily driven by a large flux of boron through the atmosphere derived from sea salt aerosols. Other significant sources of atmospheric boron include emissions during the combustion of biomass and coal as well as anthropogenic contributions. These known inputs to the atmosphere cannot account for boron removed from the atmosphere during rainfall, an estimated dry deposition. In addition to atmospheric de deposition, rock weathering, a source of boron for terrestrial ecosystems, and humans mine boron from the Earth's crust. <clears throat> A, a large component of boron circulates, circulates in the biogeochemical cycle of land plants and is carried from the land to the sea by rivers. The biogeochemical cycle of boron in the sea includes circulating in the marine biosphere and some annual loss of boron to ocean crust via a variety of sedimentary processes that collectively remove a small fraction of the total amount of annual inputs to the ocean. Thus, with our current understanding of the global biogeochemistry of boron, the atmosphere budget show inputs exceed outputs, while the marine components slow inputs and reduce outputs. Despite these uncertainties, it is clear that human use and movement of boron cycle has more than doubled the mobilisation of boron from the crust and contributes significantly to boron transport in the rivers. In soils and in the agricultural systems, boron is present in four forms. The soluble boric acid, or H3BO3, present in soil solution and directly plant available. The second form is mineral boron. This is released by soil by weathering of soil minerals. The third is boron absorption onto the surfaces of clay minerals and iron hydroxides released into the soil solution upon deep desorption from these mineral surfaces. And four, the last, is boron in the form of organic matter. This is released to the soil solution upon decomposition of the organic matter or known as micromineralization. Of these four pools, the soil organic matter pool tends to contain the largest amount of boron. In addition to supplying boron through mineralization of organic matter, organic matter can also build with newly added boron, so soil organic matter fertilization at low amounts per hectare than fields that have more organic matter. Soil imp pH impacts significantly on boron availability. It is the most available in acidic soils. As the soil pH increases above 6.5, boron availability decreases more sharply. For such crops as alfalfa, which has both a relatively high boron demand and a desired pH of 7, boron deficiencies can occur, especially in fields that are low in organic matter and do not receive much manure. Addition of lime can induce a boron deficiencies on such soils as well. So in summary, boron cycling is dynamic. Leaching, erosion and harvest of plants can result of loss of boron from the system, while weathering, residues, fertilizers and soil organic matter can allow inputs of boron into your system. 
It is worth noting that there is only a finite source of micronutrients in the, spo in the soil. Past generations of farmers have not really had to worry about micronutrients in any large amounts. This is expected to change with time, especially in farming systems that have not had organic matter introduced regularly. Boron availability is dependent on several factors and conditions existing in the soil plant system and is strongly influenced by rainfall, or more importantly the lack of it, during the growth season. Some other factors that can influence boron availability are, as stated before, the soil organic matter. This is the primary source of reserve boron. Organic matter complexes with boron to remove it from the soil solution when levels are high after fertilisation. It then resupplies the soil solution to maintain adequate levels when boron is removed by crops or leaching. Soils with low organic matter will usually need more frequent boron fertilisation at lower amounts per hectare. Soil texture can also influence uh, boron. Sandy soils that are well drained are most likely to be boron deficiency because of leaching. If subsoils are fine textured, less frequent additions of boron are required. Total boron is usually highest in clay soils with high organic matter. However, plant available boron may be quite low because of the strength by which boron is held onto clay surfaces. Cultivation. Where boron <coughs> is made more ununiformly available to plant roots when mixed throughout the upper soil surface by ploughing. Ploughing also speeds up the rate of organic matter breakdown, releasing borum into the soil. As crop production systems shift by reduced tillage to, or to no tillage management, organic matter will accumulate on or near the soil surface. As this occurs, borum availability will become more dependent on surface moisture and rainfall patterns. Fertiliser management will become more critical. During periods of drought, topsoil can dry out. Crops are unable to, f to feed in the uppermost part of the soil, thus are subject to temporary boron deficiencies. Since boron moves by mass flow of soil water, dry weather limits available availability by restricting the flow of water. Microorganisms can also influence boron. Microorganisms break down soil organic matter, which allows the release of boron from organic complexes Microbial activity is the lowest under drought conditions or in cold, wet soils. It is highest when the soils are moist and warm. Where microbial activity is highest, boron release is at its optimal. Soil pH and liming. Boron availability decreases with increasing pH. A drop in plant uptake is often dynamic at soil pH levels above the 6.3 to 6.5 range. On the other hand, crops such as alfalfa, which have a high boron demand, also require a soil pH above 6.5 for optimal growth. Liming acid soils sometimes induces a temporary boron deficiency. Soil fertility. Available ability and the use of soil boron depend on fertility levels. Balancing amongst the various soil nutrients as well as the actual boron level influence its plant use efficiency. There are particularly strong boron interrelationships with nitrogen, potassium and calcium. And all of this needs to be considered when fertilizing. There are two main commercial boron fertilizers, borox, which contains sodium boron and oxygen, and boric acid, which contains hydrogen boron and oxygen. It is recommended that you give small amounts over frequent and numbers of times. Now let's talk about the element copper and its function or role in plants. Copper is usually taken up as cubic iron or Cu2+. Copper is an important component of enzymes and proteins, some of which are important in ligand formation in cell walls. Copper is also involved in photosynthesis respiration and processes within the plant involving nitrogen. 
Copper is important for the component of proteins found in enzymes that regulate many biochemical reactions in plants. Plants would not grow without the presence of these specific enzymes. Research projects into copper have shown that it promotes seed production and formation, it plays an essential role in chlorophyll formation, and is essential for proper enzyme activity. According to Lindsay in 1979, the average total soil concentration for copper was about 30 parts per million. Five of the micronutrients, including copper, iron, manganese, zinc and nickel, are metals and are the primary positively charged ions or cations in the soil water. Metals all tend to behave similarly in the soil. They exist in one of four forms in the soil, either as a mineral, organic, sorbed, bound to the soil, or dissolved. The majority of metals in the soil are bound in minerals and organic matter, and are unavailable to plants. Sorbed metals represent the third largest pool and are generally very tightly bound to the soil surfaces. Although mineral, organic, and sorbed metals are not immediately available to plants, they can slowly release metals into solution. A deficient soil has a copper content of less than 0.5 mg per kilogram. An adequate soil concentration is between 2 and 11 mg per kilogram of available copper. Toxic levels of available copper are 10 mega equivalents per 100 grams or above. As copper is necessary for carbohydrate and nit nitrogen metabolism, inadequate concentrations of copper can result in the stunting of plants. Copper is also required for the ligand synthesis which is needed for cell wall strengthening and preventing of wilting. Deficiency symptoms of copper are dieback of stems and twigs, yellowing of leaves, stunted growth and pale green leaves that are white wither easily. Copper deficiencies are mainly reported in sandy soils where the organic matter is low. Copper uptake decreases as soil pH increases. Increased phosphorus and iron availability in soils decreases copper uptake by plants. Evidence of copper deficiency can appear as small grains in, in cropping. These deficiency symptoms are characterised by general light green to yellow colour in the small green crop. The leaf tips of dieback and tips are twisted. A typical deficiency symptoms for wheat is shown above. If copper deficiency is severe enough, growth of the smooth grain ceases and plants die after reaching the tillering growth stage. Wheat will not have grain in the head. Deficiencies have only been observed with small grains <coughs> that are grown on peat soils. Copper toxicity can also result. Copper and zinc cycles are very similar and they include solution copper which induces soluble copper and organic matter compl compl complexes known as chelates, exchangeable copper on the cation exchange sites of soil properties, primary and secondary copper minerals, copper may be occluded or burned within the structures of various minerals such as iron and aluminium oxide. Organic copper is more tightly bound to organic matter than other mi micronutrients. Copper deficiencies can occur in organic soils. Copper containing minerals can dissolve and supply zinc to the soil solution. Like zinc, copper can immobilize by microorganisms taken up by plants or exchanged in soil particle surfaces. Copper may also form chelates with soluble organic matter. Organic copper must be mineralized before it is available for the plant uptake. In conclusion, copper can be lost from the system by uptake, leaching and harvest, and it can be gained to the system by weathering fertilizer and residues. The need for copper in a fertilization program can be predicted from either plant analysis or soil testing. Interpretations for various concentrations of copper in plant tissues are summarized on the table on the slide. 
The results of the analysis of plant samples can indicate what has happened in the past, but cannot reliably predict future needs for copper. The results of soil tests are much more better predictor of the need for copper in a fertilizer program. Copper fertilizers are commercially available and they can be obtained as either a solid or a liquid fertilizer. Such an example is copper sulfite, which is also can act as a fungicide. Copper can be supplied as copper oxide and usually ranges between 0.05 and 0.5% or copper EDTA, which is normally in a concentration of copper at 0.05%. Foliar applications of copper can be a very effective way to correct copper deficiencies in small grains in cropping. The stage of the growth at the time of application has a major influence on the effectiveness of the treatment. Research has shown that cereal crops grown on organic soils with a greater organic matter concentration of 30% or more at, to a depth of 30 centimetres often res respond well to copper fertilisation. More recently, copper deficiency has been identified in wheat, barley and oats grown on mineral soils in some regions of the US in Alberta. Copper deficient soils tend to be either sandy or light loam soils with relatively high levels of organic matter between 6 to 10 percent. High levels of soil phosphorus or heavy applications of manure are often associated with copper deficiencies on these soils. Wheat, barley and oats are the most sensitive to copper deficiency. Rye and canola are relatively tolerant to copper deficiency. Iron is one of the most abundant elements on the planet. In 1844, Elsby in Greece showed that certain chlorosis in plants could be reversed by treating roots and leaves with iron solutions and this started a suite of research about iron and plant functions. Iron is most famously essential for the formation of chlorophyll. This is involved in photosynthesis. Although iron is required by plants in small amounts, iron is involved in many important components and physiological processes in the plants as well as the manufacturing processes of chlorophyll it is required for certain enzyme functions iron's involvement in chlorophyll synthesis is the reason for the chlorosis or yellowing associated with the iron deficiency iron is found in the iron containing heme proteins in plants example of which are the cytochromes cytochromes are found in the electron transport system in chloroplasts and mitochondria Iron is also associated with certain non-heme proteins such as ferredoxine. Iron is involved for the nutrient uptake, respiration, iron arrives in the vicinity of the root as various chemical compounds or organic complexes and rarely as elemental iron. Iron in the soil solution can be moved to the plant roots as a component of the bulk soil pore solution, moving toward the root as water. It is taken into the plant to, re <clears throat> to replace the water lost by transpiration or used in growing processes. Iron also can move to the root by diffusion from a, high reg from a region of high concentration to one of a lower. Roots can also intercept iron compounds in the soil as the roots grow and expand into additional soil volume. <coughs> Root density and extension are very important factors in the plant's ability to obtain iron. Iron uptake by the plant is not as simple as the other essential elements. Iron is taken up by plant roots in the greatest amounts in the zone of the root between the cell Uptake is dependent on the plant's ability to produce 3 plus iron to 2 plus iron and remove it from the complex of cleating compounds. Research evidence shows that this reduction occurs as the cell surface and the electrons from within the cell are used. The same 1 minus to 4 minus centimetre area around the root tip where most iron is absorbed 
is also the area of route when most protons and reductants are released. The cleated ion in the soil solution moves to the root by mass flow or by diffusion. As the root, ion is reduced and moved from the cleating molecule and moved across the cell membrane. Iron uptake can be interfered with by other cations in the soil such as manganese and calcium. In some grasses, organic acids are synthesized by the plant root and released into the rhizosphere where they can form complexes with iron. These grasses plus the iron complex is moved across the membrane into the root. Movement of iron from one part of a shoot, typically senescent leaves, to other shoot parts via the phloem does occur. However, many scientists believe that iron is not easily retransported into plant shoots. In the soil, iron can be found in several forms. These include iron sulfate and iron chelate. The most abundant form of iron in soils is ferric oxide Fe2O3 or hematite. This is extremely insoluble and imparts a red colour in the soil. The oxide form is commonly hydrated. In aerobic soils, the oxide, hydroxide and phosphate forms control the concentration of iron in solution and its availability to plants. In typical aerated plant production systems of acceptable reaction, that is where the pH is plus or minus 6, the concentrations of ferric Fe3 plus and ferrous Fe2 plus ions are on the order of 10 to 15 molar, which is a very low concentration. As the pH increases by one unit, activity of the Fe3 plus decreases by a thousand fold due to the formation of the insoluble Fe2 plus hydroxide. Under reducing conditions, the addition of H plus or other reductants iron solubility increases. <clears throat> Under such situations iron can be adsorbed on the soil as an exchangeable iron. In certain soil situations carbonate or sulphide compounds may form with the iron. Commonly in waterlogged situations ferric iron is reduced to the ferrous state. If sulphides are abundant in the soil these can become oxygen sources for the bacteria and black coloured ferrous sulphide is formed. Where organic matter is present in soils, iron may be present in its reduced state as iron 2 plus in the soil solution or absorbed into the soil particle surfaces. Organic matter in soils plays a major role in the availability of iron to plants. Biochemical compounds or organic acids, that is alphatic acids or amino acids and complex polymers such as humic and ferric acids can form soluble complexes with iron or act as cleating agents and thereby increase iron availability to plants. Cleating agents are organic compounds that form complex with ions and hold more iron in the soluble form. When iron is found at a concentration of 2 mg or less per kilogram, it is said to be deficient. The adequate range is between 2 to 5 percent, which varies in concentration of 50 to 5,000 mg per kilogram of available iron. Toxic levels are not regarded as applicable. As stated in a previous slide, Iron is involved in the production of chlorophyll and iron chlorosis is easily recognised by iron sensitive crops growing on calcareous soils. Iron also is a component of many enzymes associated with energy transfer, nitrogen reduction and fixation and the formation of ligand. Iron is associated with sulphur in plants to form compounds that catalyse other reactions. Iron deficiencies are mainly manifested by yellow leaves due to the low levels of chlorophyll. Leaf yellowing first appears on the younger upper leaves in the intervenal tissues. Severe iron deficiencies cause levels to turn completely yellow or almost white and then brown as the leaves senesce. 
Iron deficiencies are found mainly on high pH soils, although some acid, sandy soils low in organic matter may also be iron deficient. Cool wet weather enhances iron deficiencies, especially in soils with marginal levels of available iron. Poorly aerated or compacted soils also reduce iron uptake by plants. Uptake of iron decreases with increased soil pH and is adversely affected by high levels of available phosphorus, manganese and zinc in soils. Iron can result in reduced photosynthetic activity due to the lack of chlorophyll, which can impact on growth. The iron cycle includes both mineral and organic forms of iron. I'll start by talking about mineral iron. Iron may exist in the soil solution and this includes iron and organic matter complexes in the form of cleates. These are primary minerals and are or are pre precipitated minerals. Cation exchange sites on soil particles also occur in the mineral iron. Iron containing minerals may dissolve to replenish soil solution as iron is removed by plants. Little iron is retained by the cation exchange sites of the soil particles as compared to the base and acid cations. Organic iron involves the cycling of iron as an important process that ensures iron availability through the process of mineralization and immobilization. These processes were discussed, discussed extensively when we looked at nitrogen. The third form of iron, iron cleation, iron can also form strong complexes with organic matter known as cleates, a Greek word meaning chlor. Cleation occurs between soluble organic compounds and certain metals in the soil through the process involving microorganisms. <clears throat> cleates are very important in micronutrient management because cleation involves the solubility and plant uptake of many metal micronutrients. This also occurs when discussing zinc, copper and manganese. You will see that iron can enter the system as a fertilizer, as plant residues or as weathering. It can also leave the system via harvest of the plant material, erosion, uptake by the plants and weeds and finally leaching. Most annual plants have a requirement for iron in the order of 1.2 to 1.8 kilograms of iron per hectare. If you compare that with nitrogen at 96 to 240 kilograms per hectare, it is quite a lot less. Plant tissue analysis for iron can be problematic to interpret unless leaves have been rinsed in dilute acid or detergent. This problem arises because iron is ubiquitous in dust and can be contaminated on the surface of plant leaves. Most tests rely on the analysis of young leaves from the upper parts or extremities of the plants. Young leaves are chosen because iron, once deposited in the leaf tissue, is not readily retranslocated. Hence, older leaves of deficient plants may have a relatively high concentration of iron. Young leaves of most plants should contain about 50 parts per million of iron, or greater, and this is on a dry weight basis. Deficient plants will typically have less than 30 parts per million of iron and will exhibit chlorosis type iron deficient symptoms. Several soil testing methods are also available to help you with your determining your iron requirements. Of several extractants tested for exchangeable iron, sodium acetate and EDDHA or ether alamine diamine NN by 2 hydrophenyl acetate acid correlated the best with plant growth. Iron availability is largely dependent on many soil and environmental factors, such as soil pH and bicarbonate concentration. In addition to the extractable amount of iron, it is important <coughs> that you have very reliable soil test methods, because if you don't understand these factors, you will interpret your results incorrectly. 
it may be more useful to have information on soil pH and bicarbonate content of the soil sample and then relate this information to the iron availability. Once you have determined that your iron is deficient and you require iron fertilizers, you will realize that applied fertilizers come in several forms and they can be applied by several methods. Consideration must be given to the soil chemical reactions that affect iron solubility and plant availability. <clears throat> Over the years, many materials have been tested and used as fertilizers. Crop response research with dry iron fertilizer sources tends to favor the cleated forms over the inorganic forms. The preferential selection might be due to the sparsely soluble nature of the inorganic salts such as iron oxides and also to the rapid precipitation of iron solubilized from these salts before the plant can absorb the iron, especially in soils with high pH and bicarbonate levels. Fluid ammonium polyphosphate fertilizers were found to be effective carriers of iron sulfates for crops grown in iron deficient soils, <clears throat> presumably because the iron solubility was enhanced. Since iron, a macronutrient, is required in small amounts by the plants, there is also an issue of uniformity of application to the crop. Fertilizers in the dry micronutrient salt is are blended and can be problematic because of the small amounts of micronutrient and these are not always uniformly mixed. So the material can settle out and when this particular problem occurs bulk blended fertilizers are bagged <coughs> and preferential. Therefore the iron needs to be distributed uniformly in the fertilizer material. Homogenized fertilizers and liquid materials are manufactured in a way to incorporate all nutrients uniformly in each fertilizer particulate or in the solution. Because of the very low concentrations of iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus in soils, cleated forms of iron fertilizers generally performed better for the plant response and iron uptake than dry iron oxides or sulfates for the same crops. Not all crops respond to iron additions. The response has been shown to be variable. Iron cleate fertilizers effectiveness depends on pH. For example, iron EDTA is less stable in highly cal calcareous soils. Responses to polyflavonoids and ligonosulfates have been varied and large amounts of the product are needed. Foliar applications of iron have resulted in more uniform success for correcting plant iron deficiencies. Applying iron directly to the leaf circumvates the problem associated with iron application in the soil. Iron sulfates and many types of cleates have been used and are recommended in some areas. For example, a typical recommendation would be 3% solution of iron sulfate sprayed on to leaf wetness. Addition of 0.1% urea to the iron sulfate solution may significantly increase iron uptake because iron is electronically charged but urea is not. Urea can facilitate iron uptake in foli foliar application. An interesting approach to managing iron deficiency problems is to capitalize the abundant variation in iron uptake, transport and utilization of plants. Some genotypes of certain plants, for example soybean, differ for their sensitivity to iron deficiency. There is a genetic basis to this variation, that is called the iron efficient varieties, and they can be developed that they tolerate soils inheritably low in iron that might otherwise not enable economic crop production. Molecular genetic approaches take advantage of the knowledge about the physiological basis for the plant's responses to iron deficiency. Manganese functions in plants control several oxidation reduction systems and photosynthesis. This includes the splitting of water. Functions with enzyme systems involved in the breakdown of carbohydrates and nitrogen metabolism. Thus, it is integrated in nutrient uptake. 
and finally it is involved in specific enzyme co-act co-factors. Lindsay in 1979 estimated that the average total soil concentration was about 600 parts per million. Magnesium is found in the soil as a metal. Metals sorb strongly because they are generally positively charged and most soil surfaces such as clay, organic mass or hydroxides are negatively charged. Therefore, the ability for manganese to be available in the soil is directly related to the cation exchange capacity of that soil and that test can tell you some valuable information. When manganese is regarded as deficient in your soils, the concentration is found at 1.7 mg or less of available manganese. Adequate manganese, available manganese, ranges from 25 to 100 mg per kilogram. Any levels above this are regarded as toxic. These are crop dependent and pH dependent. High levels of manganese in the soil can cause iron deficiencies too. As manganese is necessary in photosynthesis and nitrogen metabolism, and it is also involved in the formation of other compounds required for plant metabolism. Intervenal chlorosis is characteristic of magnesium deficiency symptoms. In very severe cases, brown necrotic spots appear on leaves, resulting in premature leaf drop. Delayed maturity is another deficiency symptom in some species. White or grey spots on leaves of some cereal crops are also a sign of manganese deficiency. Manganese deficiencies mainly occur on organic soils, high pH soils and sandy soils low in organic matter and on overlimed soils. Soil manganese may be less available in dry well aerated soils but will become more available under wet soil conditions when manganese is reduced to plant available form. Deficiency symptoms are commonly observed following cool wet conditions in spring. For example, oats are more susceptible to manganese deficiency than other cereal crops. Organic soils with a high pH are mostly likely to respond to manganese fertilizer. Conversely, manganese toxicity can result in acidic, high manganese soils. Uptake of manganese decreases with increased soil pH and is adversely affected by high levels of available iron in the soils. In legumes, deficiency symptoms include pale green young leaves and a pale yellow mottling develops in the intervenal areas, while the veins themselves remain green. Manganese is partly mobile in oats. White to grey flecks or specks first appear and become more severe on mature leaves about halfway up the shoot. If a deficiency persists, symptoms spread to old leaves, then to the youngest leaves. The speckled condition is referred to as grey speck and will appear in the intervenal area of the lower half of the older leaves and extend towards the tip as symptoms develop. Manganese is not readily transferred from old to young trees leaves in either wheat or barley. In wheat and barley, affected young leaves frequently turn pale green and have a limp or wilted appearance. A mild intervenal chlorosis develops in the midsection of the leaf and spreads rapidly, becoming pale yellow green. Again, small white or grey spots are observed. These can appear as strips over a short distance from the end of the leaf tip to the younger leaves. In grapevines, it, manganese deficiencies may affect berry growth and they may delay veraison. The manganese cycle is very similar to that of the iron cycle. The manganese cycle has four fractions. Magnesium cations in soil solution. These include soluble manganese and organic matter complexes known as cleates as mentioned earlier exchangeable manganese on soil particles and hence the importance of exchange cation exchange sites. Primary and secondary manganese containing minerals and soil organic matter are also involved in this cycle. 
Like iron, little manganese is retained by cation exchange sites of soil particles. Manganese may undergo precipitation, dissolution, sorption, desorption on the cation exchange sites, mineralization, immobilization and cleation. Like the other metals, fertilizer, plant residues and weathering can input manganese into the system while harvesting and uptake by plants, erosion and leaching can ensure that manganese leaves the system. If the manganese soil test is below the target level and dolomite limestone was not applied, soluble manganese should be included in the basic application of fertiliser for most field crops. Application of at least 8 kg per hectare of magnesium is recommended. Since lime is seldom used for fluoro-cured tomato, another fertiliser for this crop should contain at least 24 kg per hectare of magnesium. As a rule of thumb, broadcast applications are seldom effective. For cereals, a seed place treatment of manganese sulphate should be most effective. Foliar application can also be used if deficiency symptoms develop during the growing season. Molybdenum is involved in enzyme systems relating to nitrogen fixation by bacteria growing symbiotically with legumes. It is also involved in nitrogen metabolism, protein synthesis and sulfur metabolism and all of these can be affected by inadequate concentrations of molybdenum. It helps in the use of nitrogen. Plants absorb molybdenum as molybate the form of which molybdenum is translocated is unknown. Molybdenum is lo located prim primarily in the phloem and vascular parenchyma and is only moderately mobile in plants. The requirement of molybdenum in terms of dry matter is usually in the range from 0.1 to 1 parts per million. Most plants are very tolerant of excess amounts of molybdenum in the tissue with levels of a thousand parts per million existing without harmful effects. A unique feature of molybdenum nutrition is the wide variation between critical deficiency and toxicity levels. These levels may differ by a factor of up to a thousand. Molybdenum is an essential component of two major enzymes in plants, nitrogenase and nitrite reductase. Nitrite reductase is the most well-studied molybdenum-containing enzyme. It catalyzes the, reduction, uh, the rea rea re reduction of nitrate to nitrite. Molybdenum is also involved in ABA synthesis. Molybdenum is an anion micronutrient and is taken up to the, as the, by the plants by the molybate ions MO O4. Molybdenum is an essential micronutrient that enables plants to make use of nitrogen. Without this, plants cannot transform nitrate nitrogen to amino acids and legumes cannot fix atmospheric nitrogen. Molybdenum is found primarily in minerals or is sorbed strongly to soil surfaces. The factors that affect mineralization, immobilization and erosion are these anion micronutrients. Molybdenum deficiency can occur in acidic sandy soils. Limiting the soil to pH 6 will correct the problem. Soil applications, foliar applications or coating seed with molybdenum are also effective. Cauliflower is the main vegetable crop sensitive to low levels of molybdenum in the soil. The content of molybdenum in most agricultural soils is usually between 0.6 and 3.5 parts per million, with an average molybdenum content of 2 parts per million and an average available molybdenum content of 0.2 parts per million. Molybdenum largely occurs in the soil as an oxycomplex. Because of this, molybdenum more resembles phosphate or sulphate in its behaviour in the soil. In a similar way to these two anions, molybate is absorbed by soil minerals and colloids. This absorption is closely dependent on soil pH, and neutrality is very low but increases as the pH falls. 
So thus, molybdenum availability to plants is thus porous on acidic soils and is improved by liming, provided the soil is not inherently deficient in molybdenum. Deficient levels are considered at less than 0.5 mg per kilogram, but this is pH dependent. Available molybdenum is usually found between 0.1 and 1 mg per kilogram, and this is regarded as an adequate concentration. Levels above this are regarded as toxic, and again, these are too pH dependent. <clears throat> Most soils contain enough molybdenum in available form to adequately meet the needs of the crop plants. However, where this is not the case, for example, acidic soils less than pH 5.5, molybdenum efficiency can arise because of the high molybdenum fixation in the soil. The geographic pattern of molybdenum deficiency mainly follows the regions of acid sandy soils, although the effect may be masked by the common use of lime. The requirement for molybdenum by plants is varied. The cauliflowers and cabbages, for example, have a high molybdenum demand. The same also applies to the legumes because of the requirement of root nodule bacteria. In a survey conducted in the US over 21 states, alfalfa was found to be the most common crop showing molybdenum deficiencies, followed by cauliflower, broccoli, soybeans, clover and citrus. In general, the monocots are not very sensitive to molybdenum deficiency. Since the most important function of molybdenum in plant is plant metabolism <clears throat> is in the reduction of nitrate, NO3, molybdenum deficiency resembles nitrogen deficiency. Plants form molybdenum deficiency are restricted in growth, their leaves become pale and eventually wither. Flower formation may also be restricted. In dicotyledons, a drastic reduction in size and irregularities in leaf blade formation, which is called whiptail, are the most common typical visual symptoms. These are caused by local necrosis in the tissue and insufficient differentiation of the vascular bundles at early stages of leaf development. Molybdenum has a significant effect on pollen formation, so fruit and grain formation are affected in molybdenum deficient plants. Because molybdenum requirements are so low, most plant species do not exhibit these symptoms. The characteristic molybdenum deficiency in some vegetable crops is irregular leaf braid formation, but intervenal motting and marginal corrosis of older leaves have also been observed. You can um, also observe stunting and lack of vigour in molybdenum deficient plants. The picture on the, van on the slide <coughs> is of grapevines that have been shown where there has been shown to be a link between molybdenum deficiency and hen and chicken. This is where the berries are quite large and some are very small and collapse easily. Unlike the previous macronutrients which are found in metal forms, molybdenum exists as an anion in the soil solution. Nevertheless, the molybdenum cycle is similar to the others. The molybdenum cycle includes soil solution, exchangeable molybdenum on the anion exchange sites, primary and secondary molybdenum minerals, organic matter, and instead of being held into, onto the cation exchange capacity, molybdenum is held to soil particles with an anion exchange capacity, including amorous materials, iron oxides and acidic kaolin clays. Organic molybdenum undergoes mineralization and immobilization. Again, molybdenum can be lost through the system through leaching, harvest and uptake and erosion and can be introduced to the system via weathering, plant residues and fertilisation. When considering molybdenum fertilisers, the first thing you should note is molybdenum is highly flow and mobile. Therefore, foliar application is an appropriate and effective produce procedure sorry, for correcting molybdenum deficiencies. 
Since plants require such a low level of molybdenum, it does not take much to increase the levels in the plant tissue to sufficient ranges. Given the fact that small amounts are required, plant nutrition suppliers of molybdenum as a nutrient available in such forms as sodium molybate, Na2MO04, and ammonium molybate. Zinc is an essential component of various enzyme systems for energy production, protein synthesis and growth regulation. Essential for the transformation of carbohydrates. Zinc also regulates consumption of sugars. Zinc is part of the enzyme systems which regulate plant growth and zinc has a role in hormone, hormone functions. In the soil Zinc are found in the sources of zinc oxide, zinc sulfate and zinc chelate. The amount of plant available zinc in the soil is a function of pH. Soluble zinc concentrations usually decrease with an increase in soil pH. The amount of plant available zinc in a soil with a pH of 8 is 100 times less than that found in a similar soil with a pH of 7. However, high pH soils are not always zinc deficient. For example, wheat and barley can get all their zinc requirements from most soils with a pH of 7. High pH soils contain lots of calcium carbonate, which <coughs> sometimes um, ensures zinc deficient because zinc reacts with the carbonates to form insoluble and unavailable compounds. Zinc is considered deficient in soils when it is a concentration of less than 1 mg per kilogram. When available zinc is anywhere in the range of 1 to 4 mg per kilogram, it is considered adequate. When zinc is found in excess of 100 mg per kilogram available or more, it is considered toxic to the plant. Zinc deficiencies are mainly found on sandy soils low in organic matter and on organic soils. Zinc deficiencies occur more often during cold, wet spring weather and are related to reduced root growth act and activity as well as lower microbial activity which decreases zinc release from the soil organic matter. Zinc uptake by plants decrease with increased soil pH as mentioned earlier. Uptake of zinc is also adversely affected by high levels of available phosphorus and iron in the soil. Zinc deficient plants also exhibit delayed maturity. Zinc is not mobile in plants, so zinc deficiency symptoms occur mainly in new growth. Poor mobility in plants suggests that the need for a constant supply of available zinc for optimal plant growth. The most visible zinc deficiency symptoms are short internodes and a decrease in leaf size. Delayed maturity is also a symptom of zinc deficient plants. The image on your slide shows zinc deficiency in grapevines. Here you can see intervenal chlorosis and small misshapen leaves. You may also see uneven fruit set with this form of deficiency. Zinc is a metal and follows the process of cycling to the other metals described. That is, zinc cations are found in soil solution. Zinc cycling includes soluble zinc and organic matter complexes such as the cleates. Zinc retained by soil particles on the cation exchange sites. Primary and secondary zinc containing minerals. Zinc cycle also includes soil organic matter. Zinc bearing minerals can dissolve and supply zinc in the soil solution. Once in the soil solution, zinc can be immobilized, that is taken up by plants, retained by soil particles or created with soluble organic matter. Organic matter containing zinc must undergo mineralization before it becomes available for plant uptake. <clears throat> for treatment of zinc deficient soils, a number of fertilizers can be applied. Zinc sulfate or zinc EDTA as foliar sprays. 80% of zinc is fixed in the apical leaves, thus making foliar sprays an effective form of uptake. 
For the treatment of sensitive crops such as beans or corns, a, a broad base application of between 1 and 4 kilograms per hectare of zinc sulfate or 0.5 to 0.8 kilograms per hectare of cleated zinc is recommended. When zinc deficiencies are suspected early on in the growing season, a foliar application of about 0.4 kilograms per hectare of zinc sulfate can be used. Severely deficient crops may require two applications. Eroded soils may also require higher applications and that the zinc be incorporated into the soil. And the final macronutrient we are going to discuss is chloride, or Cl. The function in chloride, of chloride in plants is primary plant metabolism and regulation of osmosis and diffusion. Osmosis and diffusion and passive transport are important factors that regulate membrane and cellular structure. Osmosis will occur if a gradient is present. Plant cells in a soil hypertonic solution will lose water across its membrane and cause the plant cells to shrink. However, all cells have salt, which is critical in regulation and balance. It is important to have that critical level so equilibrium and an isotonic balance between plant and soil may exist. Low levels of soil salts or hypertonic solution will cause the reverse condition and is just as severe. If soils were chloride deficient, it would actually be beneficial to add chloride since plant roots absorb chloride, which is important in photosynthesis. Also, chloride is beneficial in controlling plant disease, inhibiting conversion of nitrate, nitrogen sorry, to, to ammonium, and helping with magnesium uptake. The physical regulation of osmosis and diffusion, which include the transport nutrients, sugars, amino acids, and organic acids, are important factors dependent on salts such as chloride. All of these factors will indirectly influence effects of plants either positively or negatively which will directly reflect on the plant's ability to withstand external stress and resist to disease and physical damage from insects. Chloride is an essential element for all plants but is only required in small quantities, similar to those of other trace elements. Actual concentrations of chloride content of plants can vary greatly with species and stage of growth. Like many other substances, Chloride is not harmful to the plant in small quantities, but is undesirable in excess. Chloride is active in energy reactions of the plant. Most chloride in soils comes from the salt trapped in plant minerals, marine aerosols and volcanic emissions. <clears throat> Research has shown that chloride diminishes the effects of fungal root diseases such as tacor and common root rot in small grains. It also helps suppress infections of small grain fungal leaf and head diseases. Researchers have correlated lowered instances of stalk rot in corn to adequate chloride. Chloride can be broadcast pre-plant or top dressed with nitrogen. The most practical source of potassium chloride which contains about 47% chloride. Symptoms of deficiency can vary across crop species, but similarities exist for how the nutrient insufficiently impacts plant tissue colour and appearance. Nutrient deficiencies are commonly associated with the physical location of the plant. Whether the symptoms are primarily observed on older versus newer formed plant tissue. But these symptoms can spread as the severity of the deficiency progresses. Wilting is the most common symptom of chloride deficiency and transpiration is affected and the plant is often chlorotic. The image on the slide shows a chlorotic wheat. Chloride toxicity is more common and symptoms include burning of leaf tops and margins, bronzing, premature yellow and abscission of leaves, seedling and tuber will exhibit root and shoot scorch, Damage from excess chloride normally results from osmotic effects, that is moving water across nutrient concentrations, which are associated 
with these toxicity symptoms. Other physiological effects are not well defined but can involve reduced carbon dioxide assimilation and reduced protein synthesis. Chloride is easily absorbed by leaves and scorch can result in coastal drifts from sea spray and saline drift. Plant species differ considerably in their sensitivity to chloride <clears throat> with species such as sugar beet, barley and rape being highly tolerant wheat, grasses and potatoes intermediately tolerant, tolerant and peas, beans, clover and other legumes are sensitive. Because of the effect of one of the osmotic pressure, the sensitivity also varies with the moisture holding capacity of the soil and the soil moisture content. Chlorides are found in the soil as anion micronutrients because chloride is a mobile anion in plants, most of its functions relate to salt effects such as stomata opening and electrical charge balance of the physiological functions in plants as described in the previous slide. Chloride also indir indirectly affects plant growth by stomata regulation of water loss, wilting and restricted highly branched root systems and the main chloride deficiency symptoms which are found in many cereal crops. Most soils contain sufficient levels of chloride for adequate plant nutrition. However, reported chloride deficiencies have been found in sandy soils in high rainfall areas or those derived from low chloride parent materials. There are few areas of chloride deficient, so this micronutrient is generally not considered in fertilizer programs. In addition, chloride is applied to soils with calcium chloride, the dominant potassium fertilizer. The role of chloride in decreasing the incidence of various disease in small grains is perhaps more important than its nutritional role from a practical viewpoint. Soils with chloride concentrations of less than 8 parts per million are considered deficient. Adequate levels vary between 8 and 22 parts per million, although this is very dependent on both the soil type and the plant's <coughs> ability to be susceptible to the, to the chloride. Toxic levels typically are 30 parts per million or more. It has been suggested that the biologically, biological activity of soil is adversely affected by chloride additions. Soil biology is immensely complex and its measurement at present is very imperfect, but there is no reliable scientific evidence to support this con uh, contention. The successful use of muriatus of potash source for 150 years to produce flourishing and increasing productive crop appears to be a clear practical evidence refuting such claims. The existence of heavy ecosystems in coastal regions of the world which receive enormous quantities of chloride from rain is further evidence that chloride addition is not a problem. <clears throat> Chloride can be taken up by plants and lost from the system via harvest of these plants. It is susceptible to leaching and erosion. This can be a significant problem in Australia. Chloride comes from many, source, many sources in the soil. It can also be obtained from residues and with addition of some fertilizers, such as potash. Potassium chloride is the most dominant for chlorine fertilizer. It can also be found in potash. Soils in some parts of the world are deficient in chloride and additions of this element are associated with real yield responses and improved growth as they are often limiting nutrient. However, in most situations, chlorine fertilizers are not the issue. It is more the reduction of chloride that is a desirable. This is very often the case in some Australian soils. As a large number of you in this group are particularly inter interested in grapevines, I have included a recommended grapevine PTL concentrations for your reference. You will note that in grapevines that macro and micronutrient concentrations are usually done in the PTL rather than the lamina or the broad part of the leaf. 
PTL sampling is critical interpretation, so ensure that you have familiarised yourself with a well-referenced sampling technique, that is one that includes the collection of many leaves and of a leaf of appropriate age. This was based on a reference by White in 2003. So to surmise all the components that we have learnt about the micronutrients. There are two main groups, the metals and the non-metals. Although they are required in small concentrations, micronutrients are often essential and play important roles in plant nutrition, health and optimal yield. In many situations, adequate levels are found in soils. Where they are not, an array of commercial products do exist. If you do need to require a micronutrient, please ensure you understand the soil characteristics associated with the nutrient, the plant physiological requirement, i.e. when and how does the plant uptake the nutrient, and how does the nutrient uptake interact with the nutrient cycle in your farming system. For sustainable nutrient management, take care and understand your nutrient cycling and understand how they are optimised for your particular soil type. This brings us to the end of this lecture on the summary of micronutrients.